Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the Washington Institute for Near East Policy. I'm Matt Levitt. I have the pleasure of directing the counterterrorism program here. And I'm very pleased to uh, be able to moderate this panel on re-implementing Iran sanctions where, how, and how much. This is especially timely as we come up on uh, sanctions re-implementation deadlines August 6th and then perhaps more importantly November. And to talk about all this, we have three uh, uh, fabulous uh, experts. Uh, first of all, uh, we have uh, the Institute's own uh, Kate Bauer. Kate is the Institute's Blumenstein Katz Family Fellow and a former official of the Treasury Department, where her posts included, among other things, being Senior Policy Advisor for Iran in the Office of Terror Financing and Financial Crimes, Treasury Attaché in multiple locations, et cetera, et cetera. We also have uh, Suzanne Maloney, who's the Deputy Director of the Foreign Policy Program at Brookings and a Senior Fellow in the Institution's Center for Middle East Policy. Previously, she served on the State Department Policy Planning Staff, advised ExxonMobil on Middle East issues, and directed the 2004 Council on Foreign Relations Task Force on U.S. Policy Towards Iran, among other things. And finally, uh, we have uh, Danny Glazer, close personal friend, and also, more importantly, a principal with the Financial Integrity Network and a member of the Board of Advisors for the Center on Sanctions and Illicit Finance, a project of the Foundation for Defense of Democracies. Previously, Danny served as Assistant Secretary for Terrorist Financing and Financial Crimes at the Treasury Department. And once upon a time, when I was the Deputy Assistant Secretary for Intelligence and Analysis, Danny was the Deputy Assistant Secretary for Policy, and together uh, we made the ships run on time. Uh, please join me in welcoming our panel, and I believe we are starting with Danny. Danny. And we'll be speaking from the <coughs> from the table. Well, thanks, thanks, Matt. Um, and it was it was a lot of fun to work with Matt at the Treasury Department, and I'm really I'm always I'm always so um, happy and, and, and honored uh, when I get invited to an event like this at at at, at the Washington Institute. Um, Matt and everybody here does such a such a great job, and I'm I'm happy to be able to contribute to it a little bit, and I'm happy to be here um, with a, with a really great group of distinguished panelists. What what I thought I would do um, because I, I I think it'd be nice to this 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 subject could be a little bit sprawling, um, and so I, I want to leave as much time for questions as possible. So I'm going to just keep my remarks a bit brief and and touch on a few things, a few thoughts that I've been uh, thinking about with respect to. Uh, the reimposition of Iran sanctions, and the the, the 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 first thought that I that 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 I think is important for people uh, to recognize is, um, I think I, I think the Obama administration did did a great job of bringing a, a, a worldwide coalition together to put financial pressure um, on Iran. Uh, that coalition included work that was done at the UN. It included work that was done with the EU. Um, uh, Work with uh, our, our allies in Asia, Japan, South Korea, um, and even uh, countries which which aren't as close allies um, and national security partners, countries like China and Russia. I think that um, I think that I think that the Obama administration did some really really great work in bringing that coalition together. That coalition doesn't exist anymore um, for a variety of reasons. Some of them are quite obvious. the The point I want to make, though, is. Do not underestimate the ability of the United States, even acting in the current environment, uh, to put pretty intense pressure on the Iranian financial system and pretty intense pressure um, on the Iranian economy. Um, the United States um, has the ability to do this. I think what people need to, I think people are, are forgetting a little bit, is um, even when the even once the JCPOA was announced. Um, Iran didn't feel it was getting the sanctions relief it was it had bargained for. Now I think they did get the sanctions relief that they bargained for, uh, but Iran didn't feel that they, got, or at least they said they didn't get the sanctions relief they bargained for. You didn't have um, a sudden opening of the international financial system to Iran. You didn't have a impouring of foreign investment into Iran. Yes, there was obviously going to be an increase uh, from when you know sort of the darkest days of sanctions, but you didn't have this enormous opening to Iran that I think 
Iran, or at least some people in Iran might have been might have been expecting, and I even think maybe some people in the United States government were expecting to look at how some folks in the United States government acted immediately after the JCPOA. I think among people who don't really study the subject a lot, they were expecting much more of a bounce for Iran coming out of the JCPOA, and it wasn't there. So Iran is already starting from a, a point of pretty significant financial and economic weakness. As a result, as a result of the U.S. pressure, which never really went away. Um, I think that once Donald Trump was elected president, it was pretty clear to people in the international financial community um, that there was at least a very good likelihood that, the JCP, that we were going to walk away from the JCPOA. I think the financial institutions and I think businesses around the world were already had, as Kate and I were talking about earlier, they already had their exit plans because there was the notion of snack back sanctions that were already built into the process. So everybody had their exit plans, even those who were entering or considering entering. Um, and so that when in, um, in May, when we announced, uh, when the United States announced, I still say we when I talk about the United States, I need to get out of that habit. Um, but when the United States, when the United States announced that uh, that we were that the United States was pulling out of the JCPOA, um, and then and then very shortly thereafter announced the reimposition of uh, or the plan to to reimpose to reimpose sanctions, you saw the international private sector react quite swiftly, um, and and it's not it doesn't it it doesn't surprise me. So uh, the idea that. The United States can't continue and even increase this pressure with the reimposition as sanctions come online and with even just some selective enforcement of that sanction, of those sanctions. Um, I, think, I think the United States can. I think, frankly, I think the United States will. Uh, you hear a lot of talk coming out of in, in particular diplomatic circles in Europe about the notion that the European countries are going to somehow protect their um, – uh, protect their banks or protect their companies and, and allow them to somehow keep doing this business. I, I, I don't think I don't think that's going to happen. I don't think those are realistic proposals that are coming out, um, especially the ones that involve the Euro European central banks inserting themselves in between their banks and, uni and potentially United States sanctions and having their central banks uh, conduct um, what are, would otherwise be commercial transactions. I don't think the system is set up for that. Um, and I think that there are enough problems and, and uh, stresses within the European financial system that this is not um, an additional stress that the European um, financial authorities are going to want to take on. And I think that when those um, ideas were announced, I very seriously doubt that they um, had included serious consultations with the people who would actually have to implement them. So I don't, I don't you know, maybe, I'm, may, 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 maybe I'll be wrong on that, but I, I, I'm not – particularly impressed with the ability of, of, of the European governments to stand in between their financial institutions um, and potential consequences from the United States. This isn't like our Cuba program, which nobody's taking particularly seriously. This is, uh, this is a, a, a very, very serious matter, and I, I think uh, uh, I, I just don't think the financial institutions around the world, including in Europe, or even companies around the world, including in Europe, um, are going to be particularly interested um, in wading into these waters. What's going to – where there, where there could be some issues um, – and I'll get to China in a second because I think China deserves, deserves a separate discussion. Uh, I think where there could be some issues is with sort of small and medium-sized um, entities which don't have much exposure to the United States. Um, this isn't a new issue. This isn't a new issue either. This is what we dealt with in the Bush administration. It's what we dealt with in the Obama administration. Uh, and, you know, that's, there's sort of a cat and mouse game that goes, that goes along with that, uh, you know, discovering who those are and then sort of taking action against them. And I, I would imagine that's going to go on. But the important point here to remember is that Iran is, Iran is not North Korea. Iran is a real country with a real population and real public opinion and real industry and real middle class. Uh, the, they 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 can't they can't that they can't survive on a little access here and there, um, just enough to you know bring in whiskey for the elites. This is this is this is a, this is a real country with 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 very valuable things to sell that people want to buy, and people that they need to you know in a, a whole sort of state system that they need to support. Um, and I don't think that getting a little bit here and there from small and medium-sized businesses and small and medium-sized financial institutions is really going to be the, the, the key for a long-term future for the Iranian economy. 
Um, now, what, what some people say could be the key to the long-term future for the Iranian economy, even in the face of sanctions, um, would, be, uh, would be China. And certainly, uh, certainly there's some truth to that. I think there's some truth to that. I don't think uh, that China is this um, sort of magic wand that's going to save that's going to save the Iranians. But certainly, there's a Chinese market. The Chinese market doesn't replace everything that the West can offer. Um, uh, they they simply don't. They don't have the technology. They don't have the equipment. Um, they don't have the ability to simply step in for the West and replace everything. Um, but they can do some replacements. So the question is, you know, how you know how much are the Chinese going to play ball now? I think the larger Chinese players are going to act the same way that the larger players everywhere in the world is, are going to react, and I don't think that they have enough in interest uh, to risk a confrontation with the United States in terms of their big banks. Again, it's going to come down to small and medium-sized um, entities within China, and we again, we saw that in previous sanctions campaigns um, against the Iranians. Uh, I thought the Chinese were actually very clever in actually steering the business to uh, small banks and small entities that don't have much U.S. exposure. And this is just something that the U.S. is going to have to deal with with the Chinese on a diplomatic level, which gets me to my sort of final point uh, before I uh, sort of talk about the, the, the way forward. Um, and that is because of the, the continued financial and economic might of the United States and ability of the United States to inflict this damage on Iran, I don't think this is really a, a, a sanctions issue. I think uh, the playbook has been written. You know, we, we, it was written in the Bush and Obama administrations, and, and, and I fully expect this administration is going to follow that same playbook, and it's a playbook that's proven to be very, uh, very effective. Uh, the issue is what are going to be the political and side costs of, of, of pursuing this, and I don't really have great answers um, on that. We're dealing with a situation in which this country um, has um, antagonized and alienated you know, most of its traditional allies in a variety of different ways. Um, it has antagonized and alienated the Chinese government in a variety of different ways. Um, and these are the same governments and countries uh, that are going to be able to um, make things easier on Iran, or harder on Iran, easier on us, harder on us. Um, which gets me back to the point that I made, as I thought previous administrations had worked very hard on trying to keep that coalition together. I will be interested to see um, how that works in the current, in the current framework. Um, because fundamentally, um, I guess then, now uh, this is my last point, what I've been talking about um, before is I've been focusing really a, a lot on the, um, on the bank sanctions and on, on a lot of the, the other type of financial measures. Um, but buried in all of this is, um, is the oil sanctions and the significant reduction. Um, and, <laughs> you know, I, having been part of some of those discussions with countries on significant reductions, I could tell you those weren't easy discussions. And those weren't easy discussions in a context in which the United States was generally perceived as trying to be constructive. Um, uh, I will be you know, and that's where we start to get to some of the political and diplomatic um, challenges that I think this administration and this country is going to face as it moves forward in this. Um, and that's where I think the really interesting questions are, is how, how are they going to pull this off? How are they going to, how are they going to actually pull this off? Maybe they will. Maybe they won't. Um, but moving forward, again, I don't think that there's any sort of, si uh, any sort of mystery to this. The playbook has been written. Um, and I think that that playbook is going to be followed um, basically to a T with what we have done in the past. And I think it's, and I think Iran is in for a, a going to be in for a really tough ride. That's my, that's my presentation. Thank you. Um, Kate asked me to speak a little bit about uh, the view from Iran. Um, and as Danny said, we've seen this film before. This is Sanctions, the sequel. Will it play out much as it did in 2011, 2012, and 2013? Or are we witnessing something quite different? Um, and as I thought about that, I could actually make the case in either direction. Uh, and so I'm going to lay out a little bit of both cases and, and uh, try to wrap up with where I conclude and why. Uh, the positive case is the one that I often uh, read in the media. It's certainly one that I hear from many of those who, like me, supported uh, the JCPOA 
with all of its deficits and defects uh, and uh, still believe that, in fact, there is a path to preserving it. Um, and so uh, that case essentially looks as follows, that essentially Iran is in a better position today than it was in 2011. If you think back, follow Iranian politics closely, 2011 was the high point for the disaster that was the Ahmadinejad presidency. Uh, Iran had only just two years earlier experienced epic unrest with millions coming to the streets to protest Ahmadinejad's reelection dubious, contested, and probably falsified. Uh, and there was still the kind of echo effect around the political establishment and among the population itself. Ahmadinejad in mid-2011 uh, actually sort of uh, took his boldest stance trying to fire the intelligence minister beyond his prerogatives, chastised by the supreme leader. The entire establishment effectively turned upon him. Uh, and so you had a kind of food fight within the Iranian elite uh, that made clear that this was a country that appeared at least to be coming apart at the seams at a, at a leadership level. Uh, today, you have an Iran which is far more consolidated at the elite level to the extent that we have not seen the level of uh, backbiting or uh, scapegoating of uh, President Rouhani since the decision by the Trump administration to leave the deal. There is a, a considerable degree of consolidation uh, across the political establishment within Iran that essentially agrees on the necessity of trying to preserve a path forward that, that enables Iran to do business with the international community, that uh, increasingly relies upon Iran's own domestic capabilities, uh, that preserves the regime itself. And so uh, there is, I think, less of a sort of leadership fratricide going on within Iran today. And that's important to sort of managing the response because so much of dealing with the, the economic pressures of, uh, of sanctions is dealing with the day-to-day -day crisis over the price of eggs, the availability of, of, of uh, meat in supermarkets, the access to uh, foreign exchange. All of these things actually require a government that can mobilize a response. And having a leadership that's fighting amongst itself makes that more difficult. Iran today is in a better position. Um, the positive case, the case that suggests that this is not going to be as serious as it was in 2011-2012, also emphasizes, as Danny suggested, the fact that this is really a, a go-it-alone strategy this time around. This is not the sort of broad coalition centered in a, in a, in a multilateral consensus around the P5 plus 1, an agreement uh, with Europe and the European Union, as well as a number of individual countries to impose their own sanctions. This is very much... American sanctions uh, out there alone. Um, and that is going to, ha going to have some, I think, effect on how these sanctions are felt on the Iranian side. For one, of course, there won't be, there isn't a, a, an EU embargo on imports of Iranian oil, which knocked off uh, six to 700,000 barrels of oil a day from Iran's exports uh, from right off the bat. And so what significant reductions are taken over the course of the next few months leading up to the November deadline uh, is going to be uh, much more sporadic and, and unevenly dispersed across Iran's uh, export customers. There are more incentives for third-party assistance to Iran. We've seen ideas floated about banking channels from uh, central banks in Europe to the Iranian Central Bank. There will certainly be a, a much uh, greater tolerance, at least uh, in some countries, uh, toward Iran's efforts to smuggle to work around the sanctions. There won't be the level of, in, uh, of cooperation around enforcement that we saw in 2011 to 2013 in particular. There's still the possibility that Iran, that Iran may be able to access SWIFT. I realize that this is a very much a contested issue, and Kate may speak to that. Um, but that's certainly going to be a lifeline for the Iranians if, in fact, they're able to conduct payment transactions uh, internationally. There are no real incentives for either Russia or China to abide by the measures this time around. Uh, as Danny suggested, there was some cooperation, uh, despite the fact that, to some extent, Russia and China had opportunities to take advantage of uh, the, the, the much more stringent restrictions on U.S. and European and some other Asian companies during the 2011 to 2013 period. Um, there was a, a sense of, of common mission here at the time that doesn't exist today. 
Um, and finally, there is, uh, I think, greater uncertainty around oil markets, and that uh, speaks to, I think, most importantly, uh, the reduction of exports from coming out of Venezuela because of the sanctions and the political crisis there. And that will raise some questions about the viability of an uh, aggressive strategy to try to push down Iran's exports. Um, add to all of this that Iran is in a stronger position across the region. I won't go into detail, but if you look at Iran's reach today as compared to 2011, it's certainly um, much wider and much stronger and much deeper. And finally, Iran has already been there, done this. They kind of have the tools in place. They have the muscle memory to manage the crisis that they're facing. They've weathered a sanctioned storm and come out the other side, and that has to give the, the leadership a certain degree of confidence that they can do it again. Now, let me make the negative case. Um, the negative case is that if you look back to 2011, yes, there was fratricide within the government, but it was actually quite convenient. Ahmadinejad was a, a useful tool. Um, they pinned the economic crisis on him. They went after him in 2011. They managed to sort of create a political out and exit strategy by putting forward a moderate candidate who could, in fact, win some degree of public legitimacy with the 2013 election of, of Hassan Rouhani. And this was something that I think was very much a deliberate strategy for managing the crisis. Um, you don't have that today. There really is no scapegoat because, of course, the JCPOA was a deal that the uh, Supreme Leader, the Revolutionary Guard, may have criticized, but they all signed on to, they all endorsed. And so if the deal and those who made it are to blame, then so is the entire system. Um, in terms of uh, the, the effectiveness of sanctions, I think what we're seeing is, again, muscle memory, as Danny suggested, has um, some, some real impact in terms of how quickly companies are exiting. They had those exit plans in, in place. In many cases, the big banks really hadn't even gone back to Iran. After the JCPOA, Japanese imports of Iranian crude hadn't resumed their higher levels to what they had been pre-sanctions 20, 2013. And so you're starting, Iran is starting very very much at a weaker point. We see that even in the way that the impact has played out on the Iranian economy. The currency collapse actually predated the imposition and the, the, the announcement of the, of, of the Trump administration's decision on the JCPOA uh, and uh, came much steeper, much harder, much more quickly than we saw even in 2011 to 2013. Uh, the question about SWIFT, sure, there will be a few Iranian banks that may be able to retain access. Others may speak to that with greater expertise. But at this stage, in fact, global trade in U.S. dollars uh, is even higher th than it was in 2011. Um, letters of credit, all of the percentages are much higher today. The, the dollar is, in fact, more central today than it was even at the time of the, the last round of Iranian sanctions. And sure, Russia and China are going to try to take advantage to move in and backfill from those European companies that quickly skedaddled out of Tehran as soon as the announcement was made. But in many cases, they will be forced to move more slowly because many of them are more globalized than they were in 2011, 2013. Uh, whether it's the, the Chinese oil companies, even some of the Russian companies um, have interests, assets in the United States, have uh, desire to, to um, uh, avoid uh, the sort of blacklisting that would come from direct engagement in the Iranian economy. And so I think that we know, and the Iranians know, that even where Chinese companies moved into some of those prior positions, they didn't move all that quickly the last time around. Um, and finally, energy markets. Sure, Venezuela is, uh, is, off, is offline at this stage, essentially. Um, but we have now been through this, this situation of having knocked at least a million barrels a day off uh, of Iranian exports out of the markets and survived without massive price spikes. And I think that built in a certain sense of, of rec recognition on the parts of markets and traders and banks that in fact uh, we can weather another storm with uh, Iran's, with Iran's, uh, with another round of Iranian sanctions, and of course the Saudis and the Russians are, are if anything, more eager today to take advantage of uh, this opportunity than they were the last time around. Um, just speaking to the other points that I referenced. Um, the stronger position across the region, sure, but it's, a, it, it's an awfully costly one. Costly in terms of both actual resources, but also costly in terms of public perceptions at home. Um, and finally, uh, having weathered this storm before, having seen this movie before, I think what, what is the critical factor here and what leads me in my concluding s sentence or two um, to suggest that I, that I lean toward the negative side is simply that the, the, I think there's a much deeper level of public cynicism about uh, going through this once again. 
And that fundamentally gets to the, to the point that Iranians are, are experiencing two simultaneous crises. One is a crisis of expectations, and I can go into detail about the extent to which individual Iranians and certainly the Iranian political establishment saw the JCPOA as the end of the siege, a great victory that was going to mean personal gain for individual Iranians and I individual Iranian enterprises and a, a sort of entirely different relationship with the world than the, than, than the nation had experienced at any point in the past 40 years. That didn't come to pass. That led to the frustration we saw bubbling up on the streets um, most dramatically over the course of December, January, but still percolating uh, ever since that time. Um, that crisis of expectation, I think, is compounded by a crisis of legitimacy. Because, in fact, what's happened over the course of the past 40 years in Iran is that a government that came to power on the basis of a religious argument, on the basis of a, a sort of ideological claim, has, in fact, over time, grounded its legitimacy and its ability to deliver on the goods for Iranians, to be a competent government, to provide a better life for individual Iranians. And those promises, that continued effort to try to deliver on those promises, really, that began during the Iran-Iraq war and continue to this day, that's what Iranians expect. And it's already under siege, the you know, sort of rea reaction to the earthquake in Kermanshah, the reaction to a, a fire in a historic building a little about a year and a half ago in downtown Tehran, it's called into question for Iranians whether or not their government can, in fact, uh, manage in the world that exists today. And I think that you know all of this combined with a number of other factors, the Rouhani economic program, the looming succession, the demographic bulge, which is, uh, came, 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 is just now coming of age, leaving university, looking for jobs and houses and, and marriage opportunities. Um, the level of frustration in Iran is much higher today than it was in many respects, even in 2011, even in the aftermath of that great uprising of tw 2009. The Islamic Republic is in a slow motion metastasis. What this means, in my estimation, is not the collapse of the regime in the near future, but certainly uh, a crisis that this current leadership can't manage. Com managing the internal issues combined with this e external pressure um, with the prospect of a leadership transition very close on the horizon is, I think, going to be the greatest test of the Islamic Republic's durability. Thanks. Thank you, um, especially to uh, Danny and Suzanne for joining this discussion. Um, as we approached the, the first deadline for reimposition of um, sanctions on Iran, the, the, the sanctions that were suspended, we wanted to convene this discussion to talk about um, how the implementation of sanctions this time uh, will be or should be different. And that's something that we've been looking at at the Institute for the last several months. Um, and, and we've, we've written and, and held discussions on this um, dais actually before, looking at um, how, uh, even though I won't disagree with Danny that the playbook has been written, that the, the sanctions being reimposed are not self-executing. These are not sanctions on autopilot. There are a number of decisions that um, the administration um, has faced already and will, will continue to face um, and, and has a fair amount of discretion in how they pursue both the reimplementation of the sanctions that were suspended and um, the broader sanctions on Iran in a way that uh, can be calibrated to some of the current dynamics, both in the financial sector, um, uh, the, the economy in Iran. And so it was with those thoughts that I wanted especially to bring together these um, two co-panelists um, to have this discussion today. So as Danny said, this, this can be a very sprawling topic. Um, so, so I've uh, tried to focus on five key recommendations or, or practical recommendations that, that I would have for the administration as they move forward. Um, so I'd say, I'd say first of all that the, the guidance that so far has come out of, of OFAC um, of course looked very much like the guidance that was issued when the sanctions were suspended or, or the relief um, was, was offered. So, so this was a 180. Um, you know, just putting them back into to effect. And there are many details that remain to be fleshed out. Um, there's been some confusion, I think, in, in recent days in the analysis of uh, what the administration is doing on certain waivers um, uh, related both to requests that the Europeans made and related to the oil markets. And so I wanted to offer, um, you know, my view on that and, some, and what I think or hope would be some clarifying comments. Um, I, I think that it's not... Um, in, it's not incongruent what uh, what we've seen recently um, 
from the administration in terms of, on the one hand, there were a set of requests that came from the EU uh, and European leaders um, for exemptions from certain sanctions. Um, and what we've seen is that reportedly those, those requests were, uh, were turned down. Um, on the other hand, we've heard statements from administration leaders, um, including Secretary of Treasury Mnuchin, that the administration's considering waivers on the oil side. Um, and so on the one hand, the, the requests that the EU made were from, for exemptions from, um, uh, that involved things like grandfathering. These were, um, these were things that were put in place along with, they were clearly articulated in the guidance that was released along with implementation of the nuclear deal and guidance, in fact, that was negotiated with European states. Um, and so in that list of requests from the Europeans, Europeans I think you see a, a combination of things that are very difficult asks for the administration because there have been clear policy set out previously and some things that could be done. I think it, it remains to be articulated um, by the administration that um, some of those things will be done. Uh, you know, things like, uh, uh, like um, re-emphasizing a commitment to allow humanitarian transactions. On the other hand, the, the oil waivers, these are waivers that are written into law. Um, these, this is, there is a statute that allows, gives the president the authority to waive certain financial sanctions as long as um, countries are, are significantly reducing the amount of oil that they import um, and uh, that they keep those funds locked up. And so those are waivers, waivers that are available to the president. So I think that those are, those are kind of two different categories. Along those lines, as I said, uh, the first practical measure that I think that the administration can do is to focus um, in the energy sanctions on locking up Iranian oil revenue. Um, and not uh, as, as they pursue a reduction in, in, a, in Iranian exports, um, they also have the opportunity to make sure that Iran doesn't benefit from the revenues that it continues to make. And this, as I said, the last time around, these were two separate provisions that were introduced about a year apart. So first, countries were required to reduce in order to get a waiver. And then in subsequent legislation, um, they were required to keep those funds locked up. Um, but I think that there are... Uh, these, these, these provisions, I should say, were designed um, to, cre to, to prevent the kind of spikes in oil prices um, that have been discussed recently. And so this is a tool that's available to the administration um, and can be used. Um, but along those lines, it'll be necessary for policymakers to engage with uh, financial officials in countries that import Iranian oil to ensure that banks have the legal authorities uh, to be able to hold those revenues. Um, this may not be easy or straightforward as it was the time, uh, the previous round, because of the lack of a, of a UN or, or global uh, infrastructure. Um, but, but it is this kind of, um, but in the absence of these sorts of provisions or comfort from local regulators, banks are unlikely to participate. And I think that's what we're seeing in some of the global banks that have more recently said that they're, they're, they're no longer going to process um, Iranian related oil transactions. Um, and if it, what, what that means in, in, in my analysis, um, I would argue that without these banks participating, without them getting the comfort they would need to be able to withhold these revenues, it's more likely that governments will look for ways to work around um, and establish channels outside of the reach of U.S. sanctions. This, the, the second um, recommendation I would make is to, con it, is to continue to pursue joint action with partners on Iran's non-nuclear behavior. So I think a fundamental change that we've seen in, in U.S. policy or the approach to Iran um, as a result of the, the speech that Secretary of State Pompeo gave in, in mid-May is a recoupling of two areas of Iran policy that have, had been separate in recent years, and that's pressure on Iran's nuclear program on the one hand and an effort to, to push back or... Um, contain Iran in the region um, and contain its, its destabilizing activity. Um, in fact, it was the, the limited scope of, of the JCPOA in terms of its focus solely on the, on the nuclear side that many of its detractors um, uh, cited. And it felt, uh, as they felt that policymakers were constrained in using the sanctions tool against the broader, uh, uh, against Iran's behavior in the region, I, for one, argue that, I, that this was not the case, that I think that there was still a fair amount of, that there was an ability to use that tool in the region, and in fact, that would have strengthened the deal. However, I think in this context now, it's important when we engage, when the U.S. is engaging its partners, to remind them that this is not just about the nuclear program. Um, we have, despite this distinction in U.S. policy for a number of years, 
subsequent administrations have continued to, to, to have sought consistently from Europeans um, to bring them on board to take action to, to do more on Iran's destabilizing activities, whether this is a full designation of Hezbollah or more follow-on or joint actions related to um, Iran's ballistic missile uh, development and proliferation. And these issues are still a concern to Europeans. Um, they see Iran's, in the role as, uh, Iran's role in the region as destabilizing, um, in particular related to, to missile uh, proliferation to Hezbollah in Lebanon and Syria, to the Houthis in Yemen. Um, if you think back to the period in April, just before the president announced the withdrawal from the JCPOA, <laughs> you know, there was an effort um, to take some EU-level sanctions actions um, on, this, uh, uh, on these issues. And I think that um, what, what was clear was that the countries didn't, it wasn't that the, the countries that objected to this action, it wasn't that they didn't see this activity as a threat or want to try to do something to, it, to, to demonstrate um, that, but that they were, um, they were concerned of that the E3 was taking act action, was holding negotiations independently with the U.S. Um, and not having an overall EU approach. And so it seemed like there was a possibility still to see these actions go forward um, until the withdrawal, and, and I think that discussions on that front have, have kind of fallen off. But um, I would, even though it would be politically difficult to encourage the EU uh, it'd be politically difficult for the EU to try to take these actions now. I don't think um, that we should stop, that the U.S. should stop encouraging them to do so. Um, because I think it's this consensus, uh, whether it's a follow-on action that's purely symbolic to a U.S. unilateral action that's been taken, um, that we've seen in, in past rounds of sanctions that can really shake the Iranians um, and it's this demonstration of, 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 a, of a resolve um, that, that we're lacking in this approach, as Danny spoke about earlier, that's going to be a challenge going forward. Um, number three uh, the, is development of a region-wide implementation plan for Iran sanctions. And so um, what, what I mean by that is looking at country-level plans, um, going after Iran in Syria, Iran in Yemen, Iran in Bahrain, um, Lebanon, uh, uh, Iraq, and looking for opportunities there to, where our regional partners can play a role as well. Last week, um, my colleagues, uh, some of my colleagues here at the Institute and I put out a paper putting forward an, a, a new approach to Syria, um, a much broader approach than just sanctions, looking at um, uh, establishing a no-fly, no-drive zone in, in the northeast part of the country, but within that, within that um, strategy, um, were uh, recommendations for actions that could be taken as part of a Syria country plan. Um, they included uh, going after the financial institutions that Iran uses to provide uh, credit to the Assad regime. These have been publicly mentioned both in the, the Syrian and Iranian press. Um, and, and that's a, a mechanism that allows uh, the Syrian regime to, to import uh, oil from Iran uh, sell it and and line its pockets with the revenue, and so this is a, a source of revenue for the for the Assad regime as well as a significant expense for Iran, um, and that's worth highlighting. Um, the the second part was to go after to look beyond the um, just the financial networks. Um, I think you hear uh, U.S. officials uh, say this a lot, or at least my ears perk up to it, that the idea is to go after um, the IRGC financial networks. But sanctions, even though they're a financial tool, need not be solely focused on, uh, on, on finances. In fact, um, I think it's important to look at how Iran resources its proxies. Um, after all, many of its proxies fighting in Syria or elsewhere in the region, it's responsible for training them, arming them, uh, moving them to the conflict zone, et cetera. And the mechanisms through which they use that have been targets of sanctions, U.S. sanctions, for a number of years. That includes the airlines. And so as we approach the fall in November when, when you know, a few hundred Iranian entities that were taken off sanctions lists previously will be relisted, um, we have an opportunity uh, when Iran Air, for example, is relisted to highlight the, continue, the role that it continues to play in um, facilitating Iran's um, support for, for its proxies in Syria, amongst other activities. And there are other airlines involved. Just last week, the Treasury took action against a Mahan Air um, service provider um, in Malaysia. 
there are uh, since since the the JCPOA went into effect, even though Mahan Air would, did not receive relief as part of that, it was not take, taken off sanctions list. It expanded its networks of global flights, um, and there are service providers all over the world that are providing the same services um, as this company in Malaysia. And as part of that designation, in fact, the Treasury Department put out a map of the destinations that Mahan flies to, um, trying to, to to underline that very point. So there's more that can be done there as well. The final point that we um, made related to sanctions in our Syria strategy was to look at the 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 Syrian um, cronies related the, the 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 Syrians who were facilitating Iranian investment um, in Syria. So these are people closely related to the Assad regime um, who have not been yet subjected to sanctions who uh, may very well have assets, uh, wealth held abroad, and the idea is to identify them to try to force them to make a decision between the lucrative contracts that they're getting um, from, uh, from Iran and, and the wealth that they've maintained other places. Likely, many of them have wealth in the Gulf, and so this is, uh, this is an area where we could ask our Gulf partners as well to take actions with us um, to try to send that message uh, you know, to to these Syrians and others in the region that there are costs in doing business um, or, or working on behalf of Iran. Um, number four is, is to continue to draw attention to Iran's uh, deceptive financial activity. And this is something that has been, um, I think as, as Danny mentioned, this is, this is straight out of the playbook that's been used for many years in the past. Um, in, on June 5th, the, the current uh, Under Secretary of Treasury, Sagal Mandelker, delivered a speech that was an indictment, basically, of the Iranian financial sector and the deceptive activity that it engages in. But I think, as, as, as Danny discussed, and, and Suzanne as well, um, some people have been surprised by how quickly firms reacted to the reimposition of sanctions. But they've, they've gotten this message, I think, that the, the reputational risk um, and, and the other commercial risks of doing business with Iran, I think, are well known to many firms at this point. Where I'm more concerned um, is, is that uh, is, is working with um, state, uh, working government to government to look at how Iran will act um, to evade sanctions this time around, because I know we know that they will. Um, there will always be those willing to, to deal for financial gain with Iran uh, as much as we continue to point out uh, not only their illicit financial activity, but their, their operational, um, you know, terrorist activity and other, um, other activities around the world. Um, and, and we will need to, to be working with our partners to share information that we have about such illicit activity, but also working with official partners to listen to the challenges they face in terms of Im implementation so that we can help them um, uh, uh, find ways to decrease the possibility of that evasion um, and minimize, minimize those sorts of uh, uh, loopholes that we see. Um, so as much as many of those loopholes may come from governments themselves, um, if they face uh, challenges where they see that it's just not going to be possible to, to work through um, the sanctions that are being re-implemented. <coughs> Finally, um, short of a, of a full implementation of Iran's FATF um, action plan, um, the, the, the U.S. should, should um, push for, for re-imposition of countermeasures. Um, within the FATF against Iran. This is an issue since the, the JCPOA went into effect. Um, Iran has sought to re-engage with the FATF. This is the global standard setter for anti-money laundering and counter-terrorist financing. Um, and they have an action plan that they have failed to complete. Uh, the FATF has expressed their disappointment in this and has said that they will revisit the issue if Iran has not completed its action plan at their next meeting in October. Uh, the thing that I find especially interesting about this issue is, is a debate going on within Iran currently um, about whether or not to adopt legislation that's required to get them in compliance with one of these measures, notably full criminalization of, of terrorist financing. And I find it interesting because I think it puts, um, it, it, it is kind of facsimile of, of a broader debate going on between um, pursuing uh, reform, economic reform and conciliation, and resistance. 
Um, and you see this because what you have is, is uh, uh, members of the modulus pointing to elements of the Constitution, the Iranian Constitution, that um, international uh, conventions on counterterrorist financing conflict with. And so it goes to the very idea of um, the, the Islamic Republic's commitment to the export of the revolution. Um, and I think it's a, it's a debate that's worth um, continuing to press on um, and, and continuing to highlight. So I just want to say in conclusion that I think that there are um, three, three kind of uh, themes that, that emerge that was by no means an exhaustive list of things that the, that the, the U.S. should be considering as it approaches reimplementation of sanctions. But, um, but those three themes, I think, are first of all that we can't do this alone, um, that from a practical perspective we need to engage our counterparts on the technical and political challenges of compliance, but at a broader level, um, I think we need to consider where we can find, in the absence of strategic con convergence um, um, on the issues, uh, on these issues, where we can find some sort of tactical agreements um, to, to help rebuild um, relationships and avoid major diplomatic train wrecks. Um, the second is that we need to appropriately prioritize um, Iran sanctions within our bribe broader bilateral relationships. And Danny started to get to this, I think, talking about um, the challenges we face with China. Um, and of course, there's a lot going on in our broader bilateral relationship. Um, and uh, while China uh, does have, does see, uh, you know, Iran and, and, and Iranian oil exports as being in its, in its interest, it also sees participating in U.S. energy markets as being in its interest. Um, and, and this is something I think we can discuss more in the Q&A. Mm -hmm. Finally, um, it'll, it'll take some time uh, to know how effective these measures are. Um, and, and this is, you know, this is the beginning of what is an iterative process. Um, I think, you know, we aren't yet even at implementation, re-implementation of these sanctions. Um, and there'll be a lot more to do, um, hopefully more discussions to come on how um, Iran responds, how other actors respond. Um, and, and, a, and a conversation to be had then as well. Thank you. Wow, so that was, uh, that was fantastic. Three wonderful presentations. I'll take the moderator's prerogative to ask uh, each of you a quick question and then we'll, we'll open it up to the audience for Q&A. Um, Danny and Suzanne, each of you talked in one way or another about the U.S. ability to put financial pressure on, on Iran even solo, Danny, as you put it, or some uh, positive signs for Iran, Suzanne, in terms of the, go, go, uh, the fact that it's now a go-it-alone strategy. Um, Danny, uh, you know, I remember when, when we were doing this back in 2005, 2006, one of the first things we noticed with the first uh, set of UN Security Council resolutions is that the biggest thing that affected Iran at the time was that that first resolution was unanimous. So we don't have that today. Um, is there a delta between uh, what the Trump administration has the ability to do on its own in terms of ending the JCPOA? I think you're right. All these other ideas are not going to work. He can end the JCPOA. But it, does he have enough oomph on this go it alone strategy to bring Iran back to the table, which is the stated policy goal? Um, and... Um, Suzanne, uh, from the flip side, you know, looking from the Iranian perspective, what are some of the signs we should be looking for to judge the impact of sanctions in Iran and the contribution, their contribution in pushing the regime uh, to consider reopening negotiations with the United States? And, and do they see maybe greater, significantly greater opportunities in being able to get by um, so long as this is not a truly multilateral uh, joint effort. And then, Kate, as a corollary to that, um, do, do you see a problem? Well, let me put you this way. Under the previous administration, Secretary Liu uh, spoke and wrote about his concern that perhaps we were overplaying our hand uh, on sanctions. And I, uh, I disagreed with that assessment at the time. But I wonder if now, under the current circumstances of this, again, this kind of go it alone strategy, do we see circumstances in which some of the actions we're taking might lead others, other countries, other companies, to take actions that could limit uh, the impact of our sanctions policies moving forward? So, for example, 
Um, lots of people were very surprised that Total made the decision it made so quickly. But if you look at Total's um, international uh, uh, loans from international banks, it's almost entirely U.S. banks, which means that effectively it was completely at the mercy of U.S. policy. Does a Total or a future company like that say, well, you know, look, maybe in the future I should have less exposure uh, to the United States? So let's just go straight down um, uh, Danny, Suzanne, and Kate, and then we'll open it up to, to questions. Thanks, Matt. Look, so what's important to keep in mind, and I say this all the time, is, is sanctions are not a policy. Sanctions are a tool. Financial pressure is a tool. It's not a policy. It's a tool that is um, used to support a policy. So the question is, what is the policy? The tool, I think, as I said, I think it's pretty straightforward. I mean, Kate spoke at length on a whole bunch of things that have been done and can be done. Um, and as she said, I'm sure this is just a, a small fraction of Kate's ideas um, on on things that things that 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 could be done to put pressure on Iran. And as I said, I think intense on this sort of quote unquote gold loan strategy. I think intense pressure can be put on the Iranian economy. I'm I'm sure of it. The question is, to what end? To what end um, are we putting intense pressure on the Iranian economy? What do we actually hope to accomplish from this? And that's where I think the sort of, the, again, the quote unquote go it alone strategy starts to run into some, into some problems. Um, you know, Matt, you just said that, that, the, that the policy is, is to go back to the table. Um, and, 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 and I know that's the stated policy. One, might be forgiven for hearing Secretary Pompeo's 12 demands um, on Iran and, 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 and wonder whether that's the actual policy or whether the policy um, is to actually bring about, you know, a collapse of the uh, Iranian regime, which, you know, is, is, is in some ways a rational policy. If that's, if that's, if that's what you think, I, I would just point out that we, A, I think, um, if the goal of the sanctions is to really bring about a collapse, I think that we need to keep in mind um, that it's, you know, I think we tend to underestimate the ability of, 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 of authoritarian regimes um, that have a monopoly on power, on, 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 on power and violence in a particular country to stay in power. I mean, you just have to look at, at Venezuela uh, to see how um, uh, economic collapse does not necessarily um, lead to uh, a change in regime. And two, I would note, that um, regime change over the past uh, 10, 15 years hasn't always turned out the way, the way, the way we, as a, we as a country had hoped um, it was going to turn out. It didn't turn out, didn't have wonderful results in Iraq. It didn't have wonderful results in, in Syria. It didn't have wonderful results in, in, in Libya. So we need to be careful what we, what we wish for. Um, but that's kind of going, you know, that's, so that, that's, that's, outside my, that's outside my remit. But I will say, um, that if we want these sanctions to be effective, we need to define what the goal is. And, I, and, and my concern, um, frankly, isn't so much with the ability of the United States to flex its muscles and to do this. I think that we can do it. I think we will do it. Um, I think Iran will suffer mightily um, as a result of it. And I don't think there's a lot anybody could do to prevent that. Um, I agree with a, a, a lot of the points that were made. I think there's limits. I Maybe we can't do it quite as effectively as before. I think China's always going to act in whatever it perceives its own interests are in. I think it acted in its perceived interests 10 years ago, five years ago. I think it's going to continue to do so. And that's going to probably involve finding some sort of balance between taking whatever discounts around offers it and, you know, keeping us moderately happy. Um, and so I, I, I just, I, I think that, I think that we're going to be able to put, a, put, a, inflict great pain on, on, on Iran. The question is, what are we trying to do with that great pain? And I, I, I think, um, you know, what, what, you know, whether, whether you agree with the Obama administration's policies or, or not, there was, there was a clear connect. There was a clear connect between the sanctions policies and its diplomatic goals. There is a clear, there is a clear convergence. Um, I don't really see what that convergence is right now, and that's that's what makes it very hard for me to even talk about the issue. Yeah. I wholeheartedly endorse everything that Danny has just said. I think this, you know, this uh, reliance on sanctions and the what I think is not just an appearance, but a reality of a disconnect within the administration about what the actual goal is. Um, 
is is the fundamental crux of the problem that you know, we we can have a devastating impact on Iran's economy and that will have um, some kind of political fallout whether it's the collapse of the regime whether it's uh, the takeover by the security bureaucracy, whether it's a precipitation of a crisis, it can go in a lot of different directions, and very few of them are necessarily ones that are uh, positive for U.S. interests. Um, but I think, you know, what what is particularly missing today is an exit strategy for the Iranians. Um, the the twelve criteria that Secretary Pompeo laid out in his speech are not are fundamentally not realistic criteria. Um, particularly being offered by a, a set of officials who have just demonstrated that they don't abide by the agreements that their government has signed, recognizing, of course, it wasn't a treaty, it wasn't signed, it was a political agreement, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the JCPOA was, by most of the world, considered to be a settled matter. Um, the, the Trump administration's decision to abrogate it um, has consequences in terms of U.S. credibility as a negotiating partner. Um, and 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 the sort of offer on on record being Secretary Pompeo's speech is not one that's going to be particularly tempting for anyone across the political establishment or even among the Iranian population uh, writ large. And I think that gets to the question of whether or not there's more happening behind the scenes. No one was aware of the back channel that began in Oman, and in and of itself, it wasn't a particularly I, I think at least from what I understand from those who were part of it, wasn't necessarily a particularly auspicious start. It wasn't as though they got a lot settled through that back channel, but it demonstrated that the Obama administration, even at a time where uh, they were levying fairly significant economic pressure on Iran, was looking for a diplomatic resolution to the crisis that could involve some compromise on both sides. Um, the Trump administration does not appear to be in, uh, in a position where it is willing to broker any kind of compromise with the, with the Islamic Republic uh, whatsoever. And so I think um, that, that leads me to be fairly um, pessimistic about the prospects that there can be a renegotiation. I think that is what the, what the president, in fact, prefers. He has um, been saying that consistently since his campaign. Um, and and uh, you know he he has volunteered it on innumerable occasions even recently since that time. Um, but I think the the policy as it has been designed is one that is uh, going to produce uh, intended to produce some kind of a, a collapse of the Iranian economy and by virtue of that uh, political uh, political implications that are impossible to predict. Thank you. Um. I, I agree with uh, with with a lot of, of what was just said, and um, I think that uh, I would I would first kind of add to to what Danny and Suzanne have said by um, saying not only as Danny said do I full heartedly agree that uh, sanctions are a tool not a policy, but also looking at kind of the theory of of sanctions and what what they are as a tool, the idea that they are intended to compel a change in behavior that they are um, to build pressure um, with the hope that, that the target will change their behavior um, in order to get relief from that pressure. And it's, uh, uh, I think it, it, an exit strategy, is, or it, the words that Suzanne used, I think an, an off-ramp is another way to look at it. What is it that Iran um, would, would need to do to, to get relief, and what kind of relief would that be? Um, and 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 how would it be delivered? I think there's a lot of questions there that remain to be answered. Uh, Matt's original question for me was about whether or not we're overplaying our hand on sanctions. Um, and I, first of all, want to thank him for phrasing it um, in terms of, of whether or not uh, firms would, would in the future look to, to not be as exposed to the U.S. because I think often... Um, this question is phrased in terms of uh, the, the role of the U.S. dollar in the global economy um, as a reserve currency, uh, you know, denomination of, of oil transfers. And I think that, that those questions, as Suzanne said in her, her remarks, that we see increased dollarization in global finance instead of the other way around. But um, it, the question of whether or not firms will, will try to ring fence themselves more from the U.S. I think is a legitimate one to ask. Um, but... I think what you see for the time being is that um, more and more firms uh, are acting to, to withdraw from business with Iran in particular, the topic of this conversation, because of 
because of their 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 uh, involvement in the U.S. And even if you look, I think at some of those, um, you know, kind of on an industry level or or where they're what what field they're working in, the U.S. is is where they they want to be, um, you know, for their medium and long term planning. And so I don't necessarily see um, why that would change. Um, but I think it's something that policymakers need to keep in mind um, as they continue to deploy sanctions. Okay, so uh, let me know if you have a question. Wait for a mic to come. Identify yourself. We'll start with Sam right here in the middle. When you survived working for me as a research assistant many years ago, you earned the right to ask the first question. Hello. Oh, there, there we go. you go. Um, Sam Cutler, former Matt Levitt Research Assistant, uh, currently at American University Washington College of Law. Um, for any of the panelists, thank you for being here, by the way. So do you have any concerns that we're going to see a uh, situation similar to what we saw with the EU a few, a few years ago, where we had they had trouble keeping listed parties on their sanctions list because of legal challenges? Um, going into this relisting, is there going to be an entirely new designation process? Are they going to add new information to the previous designations? How is that process going to pay out? And if not, what's the basis for maintaining a designation in the face of a, an APA challenge? Um, well, I'm not sure how that, well, let me try to answer the question. Uh, so I don't know that there's going to be a lot of EU designations coming out under this Anyway, I don't think the EU is just going to start reimposing sanctions because we, right? So the U.S. is going to reimpose sanctions. So you, oh, so your question is whether, under what, whether there'll be challenges, whether there's going to be challengers in U.S. courts to the, no, I'm not, I'm not concerned about that um, at all. The the courts have shown that they're quite deferential uh, to uh, the executive branch in terms of the imposition of these types of sanctions. It would be absolutely shocking to me, um, especially. Uh, given the stated purpose um, of the sanctions, uh, I, I, I think that there's very, very little chance uh, that, um, that there would be, that there would be a, a, any court challenge, much less a successful court challenge, by an Iranian, by Iranian bank submitting itself to U.S. jurisdiction to have standing to challenge um, a sanction that's placed on it um, in the context of a broad U.S. national security effort um, targeting the nuclear, you know, Iran's uh, nuclear weapons, I think it's very unlikely. I think if, if, if I can read into your question a little bit, I, I think what you may be asking is under what authority will, uh, will the Treasury be relisting Iranian individuals and entities that were delisted as part of the relief? And so one of the questions is if you're going to use the conduct based sanctions and you're going to say we're relisting Bank Melly, for example, for its support to proliferation, you know, is there evidence that that is recent enough about their their role in supporting Iran's WMD program that would qualify it to be relisted? You know, how much work and also just the resources that go in as well to 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 doing the evidentiary work required um, to add someone, even just to add them back to the sanctions list. I think that they have a lot of options. I don't. I think that it, it, it it's possible that they won't use conduct based um, uh, sanctions. You know, the, if you look at the list of of government of Iran entities that were the one three five nine nine list, these are entities that were given sanctions relief but still remain subject to the U.S. embargo. So they were put on a separate list, not taken off entirely. Um, you know. I, I believe, and though I'm not a sanctions lawyer myself, but I've, I've sat, sat through plenty of meetings with them, um, that it would <laughs> be possible uh, just by executive order to add everyone back um, who's on that list in particular. So I think that there are, there are options to use the resources that, that, that they have and given the time constraints to, to put forward designations that wouldn't be subject to, to, to legal challenge. Um, and I, I think... To, to kind of add on to what, what Danny said, I think that um, you know, there's a lot of integrity in that process, and so that I think that they're going to find the, the way to do it um, so as not to expose it to that possibility. And just, I, I mean, I was very much involved in discussions with the Europeans during uh, that period of time where many European sanctions were being um, overturned by the European courts. Uh, the European sanctions uh, uh, system would have been overturned by, by U.S. courts. It was a very, it was a very, very different different system um, than we have in place in the United States. And 
Um, I think the Europeans have since um, made a lot of reforms to that system to make it uh, uh, more uh, uh, capable of withstanding judicial scrutiny. So I, I, don't, I don't think that that sort of episode in, in European sanctions history is going to be particularly relevant to what goes on in the United States legal system. Excellent. In the back? Raise your hands so they can see where to bring the mic. There you go. Thank you. Thank you to the panel. Adam Zagarin, um, Project on Government Oversight. I have two questions. So uh, we've been laying out the an outline of a long siege uh, involving financial and other measures. Um, if I remember back, and I'm not sure how many of these things uh, are the hot button issues that they have been in the past, but if you look at uh, things like the exchange rate, the availability of bottled natural gas, the availability of refined petroleum products like gasoline in the country and other things which tend to have a more uh, sort of, uh, could have a more immediate impact on the population at uh, various economic levels. Um, how does the sanctions regime relate to these things and what are, uh, I remember back uh, some years ago, uh, there was ongoing consideration of interdicting uh, refined product supplies to, I mean, not interdicting, but this was something that was really never done and I don't know whether the Iranians have rebuilt or, or whether refined product availability in the country for gasoline and so forth is at levels that won't be impacted by sanctions. But what about these sort of more sensitive areas? And of course, the exchange rate has already been uh, affected. My second question is uh, about this disconnect between so sanctions are a tool to what end? Um, the only, well, there, there's at least one end w which uh, perhaps Iran is extremely disinclined to, to pursue, but th there have been demands that they uh, lower their profile and distance from the Israeli border. Uh, th that's a very concrete demand. I don't know to what extent it's been taken up by the administration, but it's certainly been taken up uh, by uh, the leader of Israel and press reports in consultation with Russia and others and so on. So this would appear to be uh, a goal, uh, whatever relation to sanctions it might have. So how does that fit together? Anyway, th that's my two questions. Thank you. And Bill, want to take the first part? <clears throat> I can start with the first part. There was a time when Iran was quite vulnerable because of a reliance on imports of refined petroleum products, but that vulnerability was one that the Iranians recognized in part because the U.S. began an active conversation during the Bush administration about targeting it, uh, and Iran has taken um, fairly aggressive action to address that, that issue, um, you know, massive uh, conversion of its own internal transportation fleet as well as up updating of its refinery network and uh, you know I don't I don't think that's a particularly useful pressure point Iran has a diversified economy and I think probably more importantly has 40 years of experience in sanctions evading uh, smuggling networks that uh, are part and parcel of the revolutionary guard and the security forces um, uh, business model and so uh, you know this is a country that can muddle through a considerable degree of economic pressure um, but the, to my mind, the, the more important question is, uh, you know, how does that economic pressure play out in terms of public psychology and leadership decision making? And, and obviously, there's a breaking point that comes before uh, the, the, the banks are, are, are completely collapsed. Um, and the question is, what is that, bre that breaking point? Um, I, you know, is, and, and I was trying to get to that in, in, in what I laid out. Is it, is it a, a sort of near, more near-term breaking point than it was the last time around, or is, it, or is Iran uh, more resilient today than it was uh, the last time around? I would say it's less resilient, but again, um, I think we uh, tend to overestimate the likelihood that we can simply uh, – apply pressure and see uh, a wholesale regime change in Iran, um, despite the fact that there has been a considerable degree of unrest over the course and, and an uptick in that unrest over the course of the past year. 
Uh, you know, if you compare what, what we see today to what the way things played out in, say, 78, 79, um, it, it's a very, very different scenario. We don't have uh, either the leadership or the coordination uh, on the ground, uh, or you, I shouldn't say we, uh, but there is not the leadership or the coordination on the ground uh, that, that I think is capable of, of uh, unseating the, the system as it is, exists today in Iran. And just uh, real, real quick on, 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 the second, on the second point, but I'll just sort of um, expand the aperture a little bit on, on, on the question. You know, the Obama administration, in its approach to the JCPOA and its an approach uh, to the nuclear talks with Iran, uh, was very, very clear that it was focused on the nuclear issue. And it was going to leave other issues that it felt important, um, whether it was um, human rights issues, whether it was um, uh, support for terrorism, whether it was uh, irresponsible behavior within the region, um, and support for groups within the region that we had problems with, and support for governments within the regions that we had problems with, that that was going to be left to the future, whether through uh, new additional forms of pressure or through new avenues of negotiation and cooperation that might be opened up as a result of the JCPOA. I think that was the theory of the Obama administration. That theory uh, clearly has been rejected. The question, and I think uh, Matt put it well, is, is, is well, how, how has it been, 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 been rejected? Has it been, um, is it that there is fundamental problems that the administration has with the JCPOA? It, doesn't, it thinks its the time horizon is too short. It thinks that it should cover missiles and, 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 the, nucle you know, and the nuclear issue. Um, you know, it thinks that there should be more intrusive inspections. Does it have problems like that? that you could theoretically come back to the table um, and hammer out a new deal, which I don't think will happen, but you could at least imagine such a negotiation? Or is it closer to what Secretary Pompeo um, laid out in his, in his 12 criteria, which were far more sweeping um, in terms of what, uh, what the objectives of, uh, of, of the pressure campaign against Iran were and what our expectations of, of Iran were, which was a complete change um, in regime and international domestic behavior, which I think, I personally think is tantamount to calling for regime change. Um, so that, 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 remains, that remains to be seen um, as, to, uh, as, to, uh, as to what the Trump administration is, is actually looking for. Um, but certainly in its broadest, um, uh, then I think it would certainly include an aggressive conduct towards American allies in the region. Kate, you wanted to add? I think I'd, I'd, I'd just add real quickly that, um, you know, to add to our kind of what are sanctions, what are, what, what are not sanctions, is um, to, to point out in this context that um, sanctions are just one element of, of power that can be brought to bear on issues like this. And I think that, um, you know, when we say what is the broader policy, what is the broader strategy, it's bringing these other elements in, and I think Syria is a good example of that. What, through sanctions, we're not going to bankrupt the IRGC. What it does is actually, in terms of supporting proxies, is really not that you know costly. We can raise the costs, you know, in in real terms or just through public exposure because it's an unpopular activity. Um, but bringing diplomacy to bear in terms of seeing what pressure Russia can put on, um, you know, Iran there if they can, uh, you know, having a, a a military element of our strategy as well, maintaining you know force in in Syria, either you know limited troops on the ground or some sort of um, Air cover, things like that. This is this is where sanctions alone are not going to 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 get us um, to some of the objectives uh, that we want to reach. Okay, Bilal over here. Bilal Wahab, I'm Matt Levitt's colleague. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, my question, uh, you mentioned resilience and the resilience of the Iranian regime in, in withering sanctions. My question is about the re resilience on the other side um, of the energy markets uh, and uh, the U.S. Um, energy markets uh, here at home. How resilient are the international energy markets for a price hike? And how resilient is the American system here uh, in maintaining the policy when uh, we start getting a sting at the pump? Thank you. You want to go? Uh, look, I, you know, I, I think, I think if 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 this policy does in fact lead to uh, a spike in in, in the co in the price of oil, I, I, I mean, I remember going through these discussions, you know, back in two thousand nine, two thousand ten. 
um, with people, you know, producing charts that was explaining how if oil sp spiked to $100 a barrel, that there would be, you know, doing direct links to reduce GDP, doing direct links to increased unemployment. There were all, all sorts of economic analyses that were put forward. And then oil ultimately spiked to $100 a barrel for reasons that had very little to do with our Iran policy. Um, and, you know, I didn't like it. As a car, as a consumer, but I, I, I think uh, I don't think I don't think it turned into the catastrophe that some people were making it out, out to be. Um, so look, I think if uh, I, I I think I think people actually tend to underestimate the ability and willingness of the United States to see policies through um, and see see things through. Um, we're always sort of I think caricatured as a as somewhat feckless and somewhat uh, uh, near term and you know. And, we were in Vietnam a long time. We're in Afghanistan a long time. We're in Iraq a long time. I mean, this is uh, and, and, and sustain tremendous casualties and sustain tremendous uh, costs, um, economic, financial, and otherwise. So uh, I, I, I think that, that, that um, if the worst thing that happens, if the worst result of this um, is that oil winds up going up um, a little bit, I, I, I don't think that's going to fundamentally – um, impact the ability of the United States to maintain um, to maintain its uh, its its positions. I think there's other things that all could come together that would make it hard, um, and certainly that could maybe be a contributing factor. But I'm not particularly worried um, that the uh, the economic blowback on the United States would be such that we can't sustain it. I will just jump in real quickly um, to say that it, look, we we've now seen that shale has been able to weather um, significant fluctuations in the market. Um, and and I think if anything, we we had the U.S. production, the technological innovations that really facilitated um, the sanctions success the first time around um, is even stronger today than it was at that point. the The question will be how quickly the Trump administration moves and how aggressively um, the the significant reductions uh, clause is enforced. Because if in effect they they really are aiming for zero. Um, and by zero, I assume they mean everyone but China um, by November, then I think uh, that that could really disrupt markets, because not because there isn't sufficient capacity, but because it would absorb much of the, the spare capacity that exists. Um, and that puts traders in a, in a sort of um, itchy frame of mind. Um, the other question I have is simply to what extent even modest price rises, which are inevitable as a result of all kinds of different circumstances and disruptions that, that happen episodically in oil markets, um, how, how, how resilient is the Trump presidency and the Trump um, uh, you know, sort of uh, popularity ratings to um, a, a sustained rise in oil prices, not a spike, but just sort of instead of lower for longer, uh, higher for at least the short to medium term. Um, and, and that, I think, is a real question because the president himself uh, takes a, a very personal interest in, in uh, you know, the, the kind of economic track record. And clearly his base is in some ways uh, motivated by the perception that he is doing well for the economy. If that comes into question in any significant way, will that impact uh, his interest in continuing to pursue this policy? I, I can't predict. Especially as we get to the midterms and then another presidential election. Yes, sir? Just wait for a microphone, please. Yeah, Warren Madison, UCI. A lot of discussion of sanctions, the economic effects and everything. Uh, <clears throat> but I don't think there's been enough of a discussion on what the goal might be or is on the use of sanctions. And the goal is to try to prevent a very dangerous regime from getting a nuclear capability, a very dangerous regime which has sidetracked the agreements of JCPOA. As my understanding is, uh, they're not allowing any inspection of military facilities. Uh, my understanding is that there was an undiscovered, uh, well, a newly discovered site somewhere about 300 or whatever miles from Tehran, which nobody knew about until it was discovered. But the point is, the, it's such a dangerous, dangerous situation when you tie it in with the Islamic ideology, the hidden imam, the 12th imam, and so forth. And I'm wondering, I didn't hear very much about that. And the, 
the idea of sanctions to weaken it, to prevent it, Iraq, from becoming the kind of danger it would become should it get a full nuclear capability. Doesn't that have to be part of this overall discussion of the goal, the process of sanctions? Anybody want to tackle that first? Um, Yes, <laughs> I think it should be part of the discussion. I don't think many people disagree with that. I certainly don't. I don't know about the alleged violations of the JCPOA, but I, I certainly um, am no uh, fan or supporter and have absolutely no sympathy whatsoever for the Iranian regime. Um, it's it's not really a question of, 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 of that, in my opinion. I don't think anybody on on really in the mainstream on any side of the debate um, has any sort of sympathy, fundamental sympathy for the Iranian regime or wants to see a nuclear armed Iran. I think the question is um, one of tactics and strategy and how we, and how we get there. And um, so the decision has already been made that the JCPOA is not going to be the vehicle that the United States chooses to pursue. Um, and you could argue for or, or, or against that. But now that that sort of bridge has been crossed, the question is what is the, um, what is the goal and, and, and uh, what is the um, the path to get to that to get to that goal? And sanctions are clearly going to be an important part of that. But I do think it's going to be important for us to be able to articulate, if to no one else and to ourselves, um, what we're trying to accomplish in terms of are we trying to improve the JCPOA um, and fix some of the perceived problems with it, or are we trying to do something? Um, are we trying to solve additional problems? that weren't addressed in the JCPOA, or are we trying to even go beyond that um, and, uh, and, and lead to some sort of fundamental behavior change um, on the Iranian government, which would be tantamount to a change in regime. However, I know there's so much baggage that, there's so much baggage that comes along with the term regime change, it's hard to even utter it in this town. Um, but I, I, I think that, um, you know, I, I, I think that, that it's not an irrational thing for somebody to say that the, the, the demands that we have are not consistent with the way a particular regime would, could ever be perceived as engaging, uh, as, as acting in, and there's no way around that. Um, but if, if you are going to say that, as I said before, you need to grapple with um, some of the uh, um, unfortunate results of, uh, of, of regime changes in the, in the very, very recent past in the very same region. I would just had to clarify that it, it's not the case that the goal of sanctions was to end the nuclear program. Sanctions will not do that. Again, sanctions are a tool. But so you, you're, you're trying to use sanctions to get to a political resolution, and so th that's that's the kicker here. All right. Uh, any last questions? Going once. Yes, you may ask a question. Just wait for a microphone. Absolutely. Hello. Uh, this is Rasul Nafisi. I'm a, I'm a college professor here. Um, uh, this was really a wonderful presentation. Mr. Glaser's uh, very uh, uh, clear uh, and, uh, and, and an established view of what's going on uh, made me ask the secondary question. What if the regime change actually occurs and it goes for the worst? Meaning, uh, it is a pretty terrible regime already, but there are always possibilities of going even further uh, for a worse environment. Secondly, uh, as you all know, Iran has been inching towards the east, China, North Korea, and Russia. And even the military now is well connected with Russia. Uh, uh, security is well connected with North Korea. And, and China is deeply inside the Iran economy, and so on and so forth. I think that historically is not a good thing for, for Western civilization to see that happening. Is, that, is there any concern about that? Thank you. Um, I share your, the first question. I, yeah, I, great question. I don't have an answer to the question. Uh, it's the precise question that I was trying to raise, so yes. Um, as I said, regime change could result in a whole bunch of different things, and rarely does it result in Jeffersonian democracy. So I, I, I share, I share, I share your your question. Um, the uh, question of pushing pushing um, China to uh, pushing um, Iran uh, to the east and to China in particular. Yeah, I mean, in the whole scheme of things, I I, I think that um, there's uh, things that I worry about more with respect to. 
China's near abroad in terms of Southeast Asia and the South China Sea and North Korea. I think those are sort of bigger concerns that I would have with respect to Chinese foreign influence than I would with uh, some increase in Chinese influence um, in, in, in Iran. I don't, I don't see China ever, or at least sort of, you know, who knows what the world's going to look like in 100 years, but I don't, I, you know, I don't see China in the foreseeable future having a huge um, impact um, in the Middle East. Um, but certainly, uh, China uh, can um, be a spoiler uh, to a certain extent for, um, for U.S. goals and objectives in that region to the extent that they can offer replacement markets. I think that they have the capacity to do that to a limited extent, not to the extent that some people seem to think, not to the extent I think that the Iranians are hoping. And I don't think Ira uh, China wants to put itself in that position, frankly. Look, as I said, I think China, if, if Iran comes to China and offering it you know, sweet opportunities, sweet business deals, and discounted oil. China's going to take advantage of some of that. Um, but China does not want to rely. Uh, China has its own energy security strategy uh, that it's not going to depart from, um, from what it probably considers to be a temporary um, temporary political diplomatic dispute. I mean, it doesn't want to become overly reliant on Iranian oil. Um, so, uh, and, and it wants, you know, it still has got to manage its relationship with the United States. So there's going to be a whole bunch of things that China is going to be considering. But as far as China goes, um, I, I really think that the, the, my concerns about Chinese foreign policy are not with respect to the Middle East, they're with respect to, to other places. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in thanking Kate, Suzanne, and Danny for a wonderful set of presentations. Thank you all for joining us this afternoon. Have a great rest of your day. Thank you, guys.